Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on the Best of Oklahoma Gardening, we look at some great warm season vegetables, peppers, and a beautiful sweet treat from the All America Selections Program. And host Casey Hinges shows how to get started growing tomatoes and straw bales. Following along with us this season, you're probably aware that we started several transplants in the greenhouse earlier in the season. And now that we're approaching mid-April and the soil temperatures are around 65 to 70 degrees consistently, these transplants are ready to get out into the garden so they can t continue to thrive. We've got tomatoes and peppers, which really, for Oklahoma, we need to put them out into the garden as transplants. Now there are a few other warm season crops that can be directly sown, but let's go ahead and start with our tomatoes first. So we've got a Midnight Snack, which is an All-America Selection Hybrid, and this is an indeterminate indigo uh, cherry tomato. So because it's indeterminate means we're going to need to stake it a little bit because it'll continue to grow. You can see that indigo color is actually coming out on the stems, but it'll be really present on the cherry uh, tomato that we harvest from it later on in the season. You can see the nice roots that we have already got established here. Again, when you're planting tomatoes, feel free to plant them a little deeper if you're worried about the wind snapping them off because they might be a little leggy. So with this indigo tomato, the purple color is actually the same uh, pigment that is what gives blueberries the purple color as well. And so, in fact, when you're eating this, you're also going to get some antioxidants. This pepper hybrid is called Mad Hatter, and with that name, it might make you a little suspicious just to go munching on it because it might sound like it might be a little hot, but actually it is a sweet pepper. It gets its name because it has a really unique fruit shape to it. Um, it almost looks like a squished pepper or more like a top. It's kind of a three-sided pepper. So we're going to plant these. They're a little bit shorter, so we're going to plant these down below here. And they won't need any staking or anything like that, so they'll be a good companion right below our indeterminate uh, midnight snack tomatoes. So fortunately for us, peppers are pretty easy to grow and they really thrive and take off and start producing in our summer heat. But it can be tricky deciding which peppers to grow. So we're not just planting one pepper, obviously. In fact, we're gonna be planting even more than these two. This one is called um, Pretty and Sweet. Um, and it's aptly named because it's a compact 18 inch multicolored fruited uh, pepper plant. So it has a very ornamental look to it but it's also very tasty. So we're gonna put this smaller pepper plant down here in our little drawers. Um, of course, we'll need to give them extra irrigation because there's not quite as much rooting space down here. Um, but it should be a nice little pepper. Um, again, compact, so only getting to be about 18 inches tall. Now that we've got our tomatoes and our pepper transplants planted, we're gonna start putting some of our seeds that we're gonna directly sow into our garden. Again, these are warm season uh, crops that we can directly sow at cucumbers, okra, corn, and squash. Now, you might see squash and cucumber transplants available, or you might have started them on your own, that's fine. Um, but they do just as fine starting them from seeds, and it's also a cheaper option a lot of times. So this first uh, crop that we're gonna plant is a cucumber called Parisian gherkin. And as the name implies, it is a mini or a gherkin pickling cucumber. It's gonna have some black spines to it. This All America Selection Hybrid um, is a bush, but semi high uh, vining cucumber. So we're, again, we're gonna put it on the backside of our trellis here in case it does want to vine, we can attach it to the trellis. 
Now, a lot of times when you plant cucumbers, um, they'll say to mound it or something like that. We're kind of working in a raised bed area here, so we're not too worried about drainage. Um, we are putting this on the south side of an area, um, so it'll get plenty of sunlight because cucumbers thrive in the sun, but they're pretty uh, hefty drinkers, so they're going to they're gonna want a lot of water. We're going to plant just two seeds in each of our hole, and we're going to plant those about 20 inches apart. Now it's time to plant squash and we've got two different types of hybrids that we're going to plant. One's a butternut which is called butterscotch squash and the other one is a bassanova um, and bassanova is a zucchini type squash. So it's going to actually have a little bit lighter green skin than what you might see on some zucchinis which actually makes it easier to find when it's time to harvest amongst all that green foliage. Now this is a bushing type squash, so we want to make sure to give it plenty of room so that it can bush out and also so that maybe we can spot those squash bugs a little bit easier because we know they probably will find our plants. But hopefully we get a few fruit before that. So here we're going to plant these again, just using our dibble we're going to make a hole. And these are pretty small seeds so we don't have to go too deep um, and they're pretty sizable seeds. So we're going to go ahead and put two seeds in each hole to reassure that we'll get some germination there. And we're gonna plant them about four feet apart. And when we start to see those come up, we'll come back and, and trim one of those seeds out. The other squash that we're gonna plant is called the butterscotch squash. And like I said, it is a butternut squash. So it's going to be a vining squash. However, it is more of a compact vining squash, but we're gonna give it about five feet spacing between plants. Now with this compact vine, you're actually going to get a compact fruit also. Um, in fact, it'll be about appropriate for one to two servings of butternut squash. The next crop that we're going to plant is corn, and this corn is called American Dream. Um, it is a bicolored kerneled corn, and so we're actually going to get yellow and white kernels in the same cob. And it's a great uh, corn to use in practically any way you want to serve it. You can grill it, you can uh, steam it, or you can can it also. Now you'll see this uh, seed is treated, so we want to make sure that we've got our gloves back on. Um, and we're going to plant these on about a 12 inch spacing. Now when you're planting corn, you want to make sure to plant it in a block or in rows um, and not just put a couple of random plants throughout your vegetable garden because corn is actually wind pollinated for the most part and so you want to make sure that that wind is able to take the pollen from the tassels that are at the top of the plant down to the silks that are on the female part of the plant down below where you see the ears being formed. So by planting it in a block that's going to improve your pollination and increase your production. So we've got three rows that are about 12 inches apart and we're planting them again 12 inches between each seed down the row. Now we, you notice that with all the other warm season crops that we've planted, we've directly sown our seeds straight out of our package into the ground. With okra, you want to do something a little bit different. You want to pre-treat it by actually soaking those seeds for at least 12 hours prior to planting, but no more than 24 hours. You can see here the seeds are um, soaking and as they do that I'm going to pour the water out a little bit so we can catch some of these seeds to plant them. And you can see how they've kind of puffed up just a little bit. Um, it almost looks like they're already starting to sprout even but that water has allowed to penetrate underneath that seed coat and that will enhance germination. Um, when we're planting these directly into the ground. Now if we looked at just our regular seeds as they come out of the package, they're just going to look like hard BBs basically. So these seeds, um, while you could plant them directly into the garden, you're going to have a much better germination rate if you pre-soak them for at least 12 hours prior to planting. Of course we've got to plant okra in our southern garden and this hybrid that we're planting is called candle fire and it is a red okra. Um, and it's actually, the pot is going to be a little more rounded and less rib than what you might typically find. Now the plant itself gets to be about four feet tall, so we're going to put it on about a two foot spacing. This particular hybrid has tested and was judged well for performance, taste, tenderness, and texture. So we're anxious to see how it does here in our Stillwater Garden.
Now that we got our warm season garden planted, all we've got to do is water and wait a little while. And as these plants continue to grow, we will of course side dress them with a little fertilizer to continue to give them some nourishment as they grow even larger. And soon we'll be having a bountiful harvest. As you know, we've had a whole bunch of the AAS, the All-America Selection Winter plants, planted out here in the gardens this year. And today I wanted to highlight the peppers that we have. We have some really great selections. I'm really impressed with them. They have done really well all year long, and they're really quite spectacular right now as we go into the fall. Um, the first one here, this is called Pretty and Sweet. You can see it's a nice compact plant, only reaching about 18 inches high, multi-colored fruit. Um, and also supposed to be kind of uh, nice and sweet as well. It's, it's, so it's, it's really pretty, you know, makes a great ornamental plant, but it's also edible. And uh, someone uh, uh, through the, pro the selection process uh, gave it the term of an ornamentable. So a nice, I think a nice fitting name for this plant. Uh, the next one is a chili pie, um, th or the name of it's chili pie. This is a, a miniature bell pepper um, also a nice compact plant, only reaching about 18 inches high. Um, and the peppers um, will mature to a bright red. So a nice bright red miniature bell pepper, um, also supposed to be, have a really nice flavor to it. The next one here is a Hungarian pepper, which I understand is supposed to be pretty hot. Um, but this one is supposed to have, is, is, is more semi-hot, and it's called Mexican Sunrise. The fruit on this are really attractive as well. They actually start out um, a lime green to yellow, uh, and then mature to an orange and then red, kind of mimicking the sunrise. Uh, so this one is also a nice compact plant, um, very prolific, has some great fruit, um, great flavor. It's supposed to be good for eating fresh, um, for pickling, as well as for processing. The next variety we have in our display is a cayenne pepper. This one's called red ember. You can see it also has, develops into some bright red fruits. And notice that the ends of the peppers are rounded instead of pointy like many of the cayenne peppers um, have. Um, it's also a nice compact plant. Um, balloon, or develops and matures early, so you can start much, uh, harvesting them early on in the season and they'll continue on into the fall. Um, they are set, said to have a a semi-hot uh, uh, to sweet flavor to it. Um, and some people consider this one a little bit tastier than maybe some of the other Cayennes. Uh, this next one is called Escamillo. Um, this is a, um, a nice upright plant. Uh, the, the fruits are held up off of the ground so you don't have to worry about them rotting. Um, it has a nice golden yellow color. This was a 2016 winner. So again, another nice, all of them are really nice compact plants, so they work great in, um, you know, small space, in a container, um, etc. And then the last one here, this is the, uh, um, called Cornito Giallo, um, and it also has a nice bright yellow fruit on it. Um, also nice, compact, um, and considered to have a great flavor. The last two uh, peppers I want to show you are actually uh, ornamental peppers. And I just love these plants. They are so fantastic. Um, I mean, look at how gorgeous they are. Uh, this one's called Black Hawk, and you can see it has black to red fruit on it, so very attractive, uh, which contrasts nicely against the dark green to uh, darker, almost black uh, leaves as well. Look how nice and compact this is. It only grows about six to 10 inches. And uh, again, it's just a really spectacular variety. And this last one here, this one's called Onyx Red. And look at how dark purple, almost black the leaves are. Uh, also contrasting really nicely with the bright shiny red fruits. Nice compact plant, very tidy, very neat, full of fruits, and another fantastic ornamental pepper. Throughout the year, we've highlighted several of the All-America Selection winners that we have in our display garden this year. Uh, one that we'd like to show you today is the Gold in Gold Watermelon. We're really impressed with this plant. 
It's a nice, vigorous grower, high yielding. Um, it's an early maturing variety, um, but it's a beautiful watermelon. See, it's, a, it's actually yellow skinned with orange stripes. And then the inside is a really nice uh, yellow gold flesh as well. It's supposed to be high sugar content, so nice and sweet. It's uh, disease resistant and is also resistant to cracking and splitting. Well, we've been watching these. This one looks really good. Uh, I think we should open this one up and take a look at it and taste it and see how it is. Oh wow, look at the inside of that. Nice and yellow, golden color. <laughs> Split that open. <laughs> Mmm, this is really nice and sweet. This will be great in a recipe. Tired of fighting with poor garden soil? Or perhaps you live in a temporary situation where you don't want to invest in building a raised bed. Well, we may have the solution for you if that's the case, and this is called straw bell gardening. Basically, it's planting in straw bells. Typically, straw bells are preferred over hay bells because they have less weed seeds. Now, they still may have some weed seeds, but they have fewer weed seeds in them. You can see here we have eight straw bells and you want to place them up on end so the twine is actually going around the bell and what traditionally would be the long side of the straw bell is actually going to be our top side. So this is so we can have plenty of space to plant in. You want to make sure to keep them twined up and, and or whether it's wire or twine, keep them attached because that's what's going to hold that bell together. Now, if you have new bells, there's a process that we need to do called conditioning these bells, and that's going to take about 14 days. If you're planting this with a warm season crop in mid-April, you're going to want to start this process towards the end of March or the beginning of April so that you're ready to plant as soon as possible. When we condition these straw bells, what we're doing is we're starting a process of decomposition. You can see straw bells are made of a lot of straw and carbon material and basically if we don't condition them prior to planting any fertilizer or nutrients that we add to this the microbes are going to tie it up immediately and not make it available for our plants. So by starting the conditioning process that's going to start that decomposition and allow there to be some nutrients available for our plants when we plant them. So how do we do that? Again the conditioning process takes about 14 days and what you're going to do is every other day for 14 days you're going to spread some urea or high nitrogen fertilizer across the top of the bells of straw. While you're applying the high nitrogen fertilizer every other day for 14 days you want to make sure to water your straw bells every day for 14 days. Now that we've got our bells nice and soaked, and you do want to soak them thoroughly because you want to help get that nitrogen fertilizer down into that bell of hay or straw. Because what you're doing is you're creating an exothermic reaction of decomposition. So we're going to start breaking down that organic straw material with that nitrogen fertilizer. Now in this process, the straw bells are going to heat up over those 14 days. And so you can monitor when it peaks at heat. You can use soil probes such as what we have here. You can also kind of divide it and push your hand down in there and actually feel a warmer temperature down in the straw bell. It will peak in the 14 days and then usually around the 14th day it'll start cooling off. And at this point you know that reaction has taken place your straw bell is starting to decompose and so any additional fertilizer that you apply on your straw bell won't necessarily be completely tied up by those microbes. So at this point then we could start planting. So for now we've got our uh, straw bells started and we'll come back and water them every day for 14 days and we'll fertilize them every other day for 14 days. For more information on how to start a straw bell garden or what you can plant in one 
check out this fact sheet. So it's been two weeks since we started conditioning our straw bell garden. And that included every other day putting a high nitrogen fertilizer and every day watering our straw bells so that we started to break down that carbon material that composes our straw. So now at this point we have peaked in our temperature and it's cooled off and so we're ready to start planting our tomatoes. And really you can plant a lot of different things in straw bells but again we've just chosen to plant some tomatoes in ours here. When it comes time to plant your straw bells, there's actually two different methods you can use. If your straw bells are all pushed together, you can do what's called the flat method, and that's where you put about two to three inches of soil across the top of it and then just plant in it as if you were planting in the garden soil. We're actually going to use a different method called the pocket method, and this requires a little bit less soil um, or potting media, whichever you're using. So what we're going to do is we've got to make pockets in our straw bells to do this. So again, you can see we had our straw bells up on end, and so we're just going to use our trowel to kind of dig in there. Um, because we're planting tomatoes that prefer a spacing of about two feet, we're going to be able to plant two tomatoes per bell. So we're going to create two pockets on either end of our bells of straw. So you can see we've dug out some of our straw and created little holes or pockets in our straw bells. So we're going to add a little bit of potting soil in there just to, again, give those plants something to kind of root into. But eventually the plant's going to really root into the straw bell itself. Now, we're planting a couple of different sizes of plants here. Um, you might remember that we started these transplants in the greenhouse, and some are still in a six-pack six pot and some we've potted up into four inch. Now the nice thing about a smaller transplant is it's easier to put in the pocket, obviously. You could, if, depending on what crop you were growing, you could just start by planting a seed straight into the straw bell as well. And some people say that that actually works better because it allows that seed from germination to begin growing into the straw. But transplants obviously are the way to go when you're looking at tomatoes. So we've got two varieties of tomatoes that are, again, all America selections that we're going to be planting. Um, we've got one that's called Candyland and then also one that's called Valentine. And we've chosen these two to use in our straw bells because they're both small uh, tomatoes. Candyland is a current type tomato, which means it's going to be a little bit smaller than a cherry tomato. Um, and it has a really nice a deep red uh, color to it, and it's also a very sweet flavor. Valentine um, is also a small uh, tomato, but it's more of a grape type tomato, so it's going to have a little bit more of an oval shape to the tomato. Um, it has, a, again, a deep red look to it, but it's going to have a bit more of a meaty uh, texture to it, almost like a Roma tomato. Um, but both of them are really good, and the reason why I've chosen, again, these two particular ones for our straw bell gardens is because they both prefer a spacing of about two feet. Um, they are indeterminate, and they're going to get taller, about six feet tall, so we're going to need to stake them eventually. Um, but with the cherry or currant or grape type tomatoes, a lot of times the harvesting can be the the nuisance because there's more to harvest. And so at least by elevating them in this raised bed, they're going to be more in your face and easier to harvest or maybe pick as you're walking by to just pop one in your mouth. Um, the Candyland variety is actually touted as having more of the fruit on the outside of the shrub or the vine, so it's also easier to harvest that way. So we're going to put both Candyland and Valentine in our straw bells. And again, with a six pack here, you can see that we're talking about a much smaller root ball there, and so we'll just be able to plant that right in there. Again, with tomatoes, if you're new to planting tomatoes, you don't have to plant them at the same height that they were in the original container. You can actually plant them a little bit deeper. Um, that's a lot of times important to do in Oklahoma winds if they're tall and leggy. Um, it gives them a little bit more stability. So that's all we're going to do. If you wanted to, you could add a little mulch again just to put some of that straw back around them to cover them. Um, and of course we're going to water these in when we get them all planted. 
For more information about how to start and grow in straw bells, check out this fact sheet. There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead. Next week, we have sheds full of inspiration as we visit some of our favorite garden storage structures and their beautiful surrounding gardens from last year. We hope you join us in for more TV You'll Grow to Love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagarding.okstate.edu And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and the Tulsa Garden Club.